In this video, I would like to share some ideas about economic efficiency and distributional fairness. You should be familiar with some basic economics concepts like allocation of scarce resources, efficiency and preferences or utility functions. The goal is to show that some standard textbook wisdoms, which are often told in introductory courses in economics, are based on some not so unproblematic normative assumptions which are not made explicit. And if we relax them, then we will arrive at very different results with different policy implications. Let us start with a brief recap about efficiency. Technical efficiency very simply means that there is no waste of resources when we are producing goods. Allocation efficiency, however, is a little bit more tricky. This answers the question how we can make the best use of resources given individual preferences. This refers to a very important concept which is used in economics, namely the Pareto efficiency criterion. An allocation is called efficient when a reallocation of the resources cannot make anybody better off without making at least another person worse off. And this better off and worse off is in terms of the individual utilities. That's very important here. Economists see efficiency, economic efficiency, as an imperative which directly follows from the normative economic principles, namely to make the best use of the scarce resources. I think that's quite clear. On the other hand, other criteria like distributional fairness or justice are not seen as an immediate implication from economic principles. And therefore, most economists share the view that fairness or justice criteria are often seen as given from outside economics. Once when these fairness criteria or justice criteria are given, then economists could explore how to achieve these fair situations or these fair outcomes in an efficient manner. And they also highlight the potential goal conflicts between efficiency and distributional fairness. However, this requires that we can logically disentangle efficiency and distributional fairness. And in this video, this view will be challenged. Let us start with a very simple example, which you sometimes can find in textbooks or in introductory courses in economics. Let us assume that we have a resource allocation such that we achieve a cake, which is split up into four parts. Let's say that we have four persons and the size of the cake is 16 and each person has a size of four. Okay, this is situation A and now let us compare this to another situation, another allocation of resources so that the resulting cake is larger, namely 25, and the allocation is as such. Three persons have a size of five and one person has a size of 10. Is this a Pareto improvement? Or in other words, is situation A efficient if we could also achieve situation B? You clearly see when applying the Pareto efficiency criterion that situation A is not efficient because we can make all better off without making another one worse off. So the Pareto efficiency criterion is not fulfilled in situation A. Henceforth, if we're answering the question, is this a Pareto improvement if we are reallocating the resources and move from situation A to situation B? The answer is clearly yes. But now you see that in situation B, the inequality is much larger. One person has a cake size of 10 and the other three have only five. So we can see this as, yeah, let's say, unfair or unjust depending on your fairness criterion. So we might think about a kind of redistribution so that the person who owes 10 is perhaps taxed and has to give up one unit to each of the other persons. So this is a kind of redistribution and the result of this redistribution would be an allocation like in situation C. 
three persons have then a cake size of six and the other person a size of seven. Again, the question, is this a Pareto improvement? We see three persons are better off, one person is worse off. Hmm. So the Pareto efficiency criterion is fulfilled for both situations. So moving from B to C is not a Pareto improvement. And moving from C to B is also not a Pareto improvement because always one person, or at least one person, is worse off. So the answer to the question here is clearly no. All right, perhaps you know this example already from textbooks or so, but I would like to raise a warning sign. The argumentation here is based on a normative trick, to say so, which frames the mindset with a very special border case about the assumptions of the underlying preferences, which is then very easily but mistakenly accepted as a very general case and a general insight of economics. Let us go a little bit into the details. As I've mentioned, the Pareto criterion is based on individual subjective preferences about the outcomes. What does this mean? So in economics, we have a good theory about preferences. We have an axiomatic framework, how to represent preferences. More precisely, we have several of these axiomatic frameworks, but the most famous one draws back to von Neumann and Morgenstern from the 1940s. And the rational choice theory in economics is based on such an axiomatic framework. We also call this expected utility theory. And according to this framework, rational behavior just means that the individuals evaluate the outcomes in a manner which is consistent with their preferences. And then they are making decisions then accordingly. That's all. So it's a kind of consistency requirement. It does not tell anything about the content of these preferences. And that's a very important point I would like to highlight here. So whether a situation, an outcome is evaluated by an individual as an improvement or in contrast that the individual feels that it's worse off, this depends on the content of these preferences. And this framework, this axiomatic framework of expected utility theory does not tell anything about this content. So the underlying trick we have made in the previous example was that we just presumed that the people are selfish and they are only interested in their own material outcome. And this assumption can be rejected by a huge body of empirical and experimental evidence, which we know from behavioral economics. So what we know is that most individuals are evaluating not only their own outcome, but also the outcome of others and therefore outcome differences. This is called other regarding preferences or social preferences. So they don't just look to their own outcome. In many cases, the preferences are characterized by, to some degree at least, by inequality aversion. People are averse against two strong inequalities in the outcomes because they are comparing the outcome with others. They are comparing their place in a group, to say so, compared to others in the group. There are more insights from behavioral economics, namely that individuals behave in a fair and cooperative manner if and only if they expect that they are treated in the same way by the others, so-called reciprocity or reciprocity preferences. And even more, individuals have also fairness preferences, not only just regarding the outcome, but also regarding the allocation procedure, so how we come to a certain outcome. So again, the rational choice approach, the expect utility theory, does not presume any special preferences. Economists have the tendency to assume selfish preferences and that individuals are only interested in their own material outcome as a convenience assumption, which is a special assumption, but not the general case. 
In behavior economics, many attempts have been done to model these kind of other regarding preferences, social preferences or inequality aversion. And here for the purpose of this video, I will just introduce briefly into the so-called fair Schmidt preferences, which is a relatively old concept. These fair Schmidt preferences look like follows. Let's say that we have n individuals. In our example before, n would be 4. The individual i has a utility function ui, which looks like follows. The first component is xi. So this is simply the material outcome of this individual. In our case, the size of the cake piece, to say so. And then we have two additional terms. And let us first have a look to the first term here. What do we see here? The, there's a max function. And here we have two arguments, zero, and this is the difference of another individual j, the outcome of the another individual j minus my own outcome. If this difference is positive, yeah, then the max function will count this difference. This is then summed up. So all difference where others have more than me, all these cases are count together and then divided by n minus one. So what this function is doing here, it counts kind of the average of all the cases where the others have more than me. The second term is, has the same structure, but here's the other way around. This counts where xi is larger than xj, so where this difference is larger than zero. So all the cases where individual i has more than individual j. Also summed up, normalized by dividing by n minus one. And then we have to take into consideration these two terms, alpha i and beta i. These terms should be positive, so beta should be seen as between zero and one and alpha is typically larger than beta, which describe the degree of inequality aversion. And they are doing this in a kind of asymmetric manner. People are more averse against cases where others have more than themselves. So this is reflected here in the parameter alpha, which is seen as typically larger than beta. And beta, these are the cases where I have more than others, so also these cases, in these cases, people feel a little bit uncomfortable or have a little bit compassion with others. So they feel sorry that they are so much better off than others. So this is also diminishing the utility. Look, both terms have a negative sign. So all cases where either others have more than me or I have more than others is seen as utility diminishing. That's inequality aversion. In case that alpha and beta would be exactly zero, so the terms T1 and T2 drop out, then we have simple selfish preferences and uh, the individuals are only interested in their own material outcome. So this is included here as a special case, but in general alpha and beta should be seen as positive numbers. All right, for all who are interested in the source, this is the original publication by Fehr and Schmidt. You see that it's meanwhile more than 20 years old, but in the meantime, more models and more differentiated models of inequality aversion has been developed in behavioral economics. But the, for the purpose of this video, this relatively simple model is completely sufficient. This concept by Fehr and Schmidt was already successfully applied to a couple of experimental results, in particular from ultimatum bargaining games, where the topic is also how to split up a cake. Let us apply this concept to our previous situation. You see here this three allocations, A, B, C. As a reminder, we have here the fair schmidt preference function. And let us assume specific parameters, namely alpha is equal to one and beta should be equal to 0.8. As a remember, beta should be between 0 and 1. Now let us again consider the question whether the movement from situation A to B is a Pareto improvement and from B to C is also a Pareto improvement or not. Good, let us apply this utility function to the first situation. Here everybody has the same size of the cake, namely 4, 
So there are no differences. So the first term is zero, the second term is zero. The utilities just stems from, from the material outcome, namely four. That's quite obvious and very simple. What about situation B? Here the utilities are as follows. We start with a green agent here, with a green uh, uh, piece of the cake, yeah, which is has the size five. And then minus alpha, alpha is one, times one by n minus one. Okay, we have n equals to four players, so this is one by three. And then there's just one situation where this agent has less than another agent, namely if you're comparing the green with the red agent, and here the difference is five. So if you are putting these things into the formula, the outcome is 3.5. 3, 3. And for the red individual who has 10, now we put this into the utility function. First term is zero because nobody has more than this individual. But the second term applies here. So three times the individual is aware that he or she has more than the others. Okay, beta is 0 0.8. You find it here. Again, one by n minus one is one by three. The difference is five. And this is observed three times. So it is summed up for all these three cases here. And the result is six. So if you now compare, is this a Pareto improvement if we're going from A to B? Then the answer is, oh, no, it isn't. Although the green individuals, to say so, have a larger piece, namely five instead of four, they feel uncomfortable, they feel treated in an unfair manner because there is another individual which has much, much more than they. So therefore, the new allocation is seen not as an improvement. Materially, it is, but not in terms of utility if we are considering fairness criteria or inequality aversion. The red individual experience an improvement. That's true, but not all. And therefore, the answer to the question, is this a Pareto improvement? The answer is no. Now from B to C. Does the redistribution help? We are taking these numbers here and putting them into the fair schmidt utility function. And the result is like follows. You see the structure is the same, but the difference is only one so that the green agents now have a utility of 5.67, roundabout, and the red individual has a utility of 6.2. So if you compare these numbers, all persons are better off. So the answer to the question, is this a Pareto improvement, is yes, it is. So that's surprising. The results are quite the opposite than we had in the previous situation with selfish preferences where the persons are only interested in their own material outcome. So if you are summing up, we have opposite results than in the case of selfish preferences and moving from situation A to B is here not a Pareto improvement, although all have material seen a higher outcome but the outcomes are more unequal and therefore seem more unfair. And therefore the subjective evaluation of the new situation B is seen as inferior by three of four persons. So it is not a Pareto improvement. While the improvement from B to C is very clear, so redistribution here helps, all individuals feel better off, including the text person in red color, as you have seen. So also this person would prefer situation C over situation B. So what we have learned here is that changing the underlying preference assumptions, namely from selfishness to inequality aversion, modeled by Fair-Schmidt preferences in this case, drastically changes the efficiency assessment of the outcomes. So what is the conclusion of this video? First, in the very general case, if we allow for arbitrary preferences, which might eventually also include other regarding preferences, then it is not possible to logically disentangle efficiency and distributional fairness concerns. This is only possible in a super special case of pure self-interest. 
And this pure material self-interest is a special case and therefore only a convenience assumption many economists are doing because then it's very easy to arrive at some standard results in economics in a very easy manner without mathematical complications and so on and so forth. But we should always be aware that this is not an implication of our rationality principles. The rationality principles just require that we have a consistent description of preferences and that we are behaving consistently to these preferences, irrespective of the content of these preferences. And the other important message here from this video is that preferences could be about everything, not just about the consumed bundle of goods. People are not always, but quite often, also interested in the well-being of other persons. They have interest in the social relationships, they are interested in the social environmental conditions, how this bundle of goods is produced, they are interested in whether they are living in freedom and peace, and, and whether they feel to be treated in a fair and just manner, and so on and so forth. So the preferences of individuals are about everything, about the entire conditions of life, to say so. And in economics, we are usually boiling this down to a super simple case that preferences are about pizza and sausage or a very simple bundle of goods. Now, this makes the life very easy. Now, we can, uh, in a very convenient manner, derive uh, demand functions and results as we have seen before in this video. But it is a convenience assumption. And this should be made clear that this is a quite heavy and very special normative assumption and the results could not be generalized. And econ economists should take this very seriously. At the end, I would like to mention two caveats. The first one is that not all people have pro-social preferences. Not all people are really inequality averse or to a small degree. In fact, we see a broad range of preferences. So it's not the case that the Fier-Schmidt preferences are characterizing the general case. But it is a possible case, and I have shown that if we are allowing for inequality aversion, then some implications do not hold true in standard economics. The second caveat is that although I have now destroyed a mainstream economics argument, namely that we can disentangle efficiency and fairness concerns, and fairness and justice concerns uh, are typically in a kind of conflict with efficiency. Um, my argumentation was not based on a different paradigm, to say so. My argumentation makes heavy use of the utility function, namely the expected utility approach, on the one hand, and on the other hand, of the Pareto efficiency criterion, which is also a mainstream neoclassical concept. So I'm using standard mainstream concept, concepts to attack mainstream results which are based on hidden convenience assumptions which are not made explicit.